Well, good afternoon, everybody. Why do people pray? And before we consider our subject for this afternoon, I think the first thing we must uh, consider is what do we mean by the word prayer? Well, it's quite simply having a conversation with God. However, it's not like having a conversation with someone on the telephone. That conversation is usually a two-way contact. You speak to someone at the other end of the phone and they can answer you and converse with you. With God, it is a one-way conversation. But that does not mean that God is not listening. Again, I'm quite sure uh, you will have telephoned someone but they have not been able to receive your call. So you leave a message on the answering machine and you presume that they will pick it up, uh, your message, when they come in. Well, to put it like crudely, that is similar to the conversation you have with God. He might not give you what you want, and God will provide for us uh, for our daily needs. But he's not like a genie. He will not grant you three wishes. But he is a loving father who cares for us and wants, wants what is best for us. And one thing that we do have to remember is that prayer gives that opportunity to talk to God and to give him praise that is due to him. Will you come with me first of all then to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 7. Matthew's Gospel and chapter 7. This is what we are told about prayer. Verse 7. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened up to you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And if you just turn to the book of James, which is towards the back end of the Bible, back end of James and chapter 5. The book of James and chapter 5. And we read there at verse 16 Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now what I'd like to do now is to draw your attention to a parable that was told by Jesus. And for the benefit of you who do not know what a parable is well briefly it's a story which has two meanings. The first meaning is usually about an earthly or a, a event that you can relate to. And the second relates to a godly or a heavenly meaning. So will you come with me now to Luke's Gospel and chapter 18. Luke and chapter 18. See, the reason I'm giving you these references is that you can look them for yourself and you can see that these are the words of our Heavenly Father. And not, and not my words. Luke's Gospel and chapter 18. And we read there at verse 9. And Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. And in this introduction to the parable, Jesus of course referring to the Pharisees, who had little or no time for others, and in particular the Sadducees and the Gentiles. <coughs> the Pharisees, they believed that they were following the Mosaic law to the letter, which excluded all others. So we read there now at verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Again, what is the difference between a Pharisee and a publican? Well, in actual fact, they're both Jews. However, the Pharisee believes totally in the Mosaic law and, try, and tries to live strictly by it. And they also believe that God would send them a Messiah who would bring priests to the earth and rule from Jerusalem. 
they also believed in the resurrection of the dead. And they also believed that all circumstances that affected their daily lives were divinely ordained. They had no time for anyone who was not a Pharisee. The publican, on the other hand, whilst he was still a Jew, made contracts with the Roman uh, legions and military, supplying them with goods. And they also collected port duties and taxes uh, from the uh, people. And sometimes they used some of the taxes they collected in order to boost their own incomes. So as you can imagine, they were not liked by the other Jews. By Jesus using these two, exa exa two as an example, is what you might say, we are looking at two extremes. Let's go back now to verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Yes, he's given the impression that he is a perfect example, being a sinless person, doing everything that is required. But here we can see that there is no request for the forgiveness of sins. As far as he's concerned, everything he does is within the law of Moses. And in his mind, he's doing everything that is required of him. The point is, is his prayer genuine? Was it genuine and from the heart? Was it sincere? And then we read in verse 13, And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift as much as his eyes towards heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. And we see here that our publican is full of remorse and asks for forgiveness. And this is what Jesus says, verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And I think this parable leaves us in no doubt that believers should pray to our Heavenly Father, and that there is also a right way and a wrong way of going about it. Being too willing to admit our fault, being only too will to admit our faults. And Jesus from this parable lives in no doubt the example of the Pharisee which leaves much to be desired. And whilst the publican was honest with his submission, and what lessons can we learn from this parable? It is that when we pray, we have to be honest and sincere. So then, why do we pray? Well, for a moment, let's look at the world in which we live. In my view, and I must stress, this is my own personal view, we can divide society into two sections. The haves and the have-nots. On the one side, we have those who have jobs, a reasonable lifestyle, and enjoy family life. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying here that everyone is rich, living in a life of luxury. But by careful management, carefully looking after the accounts, get by on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we have the have-nots. And for various reasons, they cannot get a job. And because of final restraints imposed by the government, they've had their benefits either reduced or even cancelled. It might be through illness or infirmities uh, that they have found themselves in difficulties. Again, the help they would usually get from the local authorities is not there because the money has been cut by the government or has been capped. And again, you get rising costs of rents, rates, gas, electricity. They've all been increased. These all add to the burden of the, in their daily lives. And they are finding it difficult to make ends meet and are at their wits' ends, not knowing which way to turn. And what is the result? They might even face conviction, eviction from their property they occupy. What happens then? As a last resort, they turn to pray, hoping that God might come to their rescue. If we cast our minds back to the middle of March this year, East Africa, and in particular the provinces of Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe, this area was struck by a cyclone. 
And the result was that entire villages uh, were flattened to the ground, leaving people with nothing apart from what they were wearing. What else could they do? In desperation, they turned to prayer, asking God for help and guidance. Now, when I was a young man, on many occasions, major incidents occurred. You might have a gale force wind which blew a lot of tiles off houses. You might have a period of prolonged rain uh, which resulted in flooding. And when you put your claim in, the insurance companies used to refuse to meet the claim. Why? Because they said it was an act of God. Yes, we pray to ask for help, guidance and even support and comfort in these times of need. And apart from these examples I've just mentioned, we also pray to our Heavenly Father, giving Him thanks for providing all our daily needs, for looking after us and keeping us safe. But we also ask Him for forgiveness for the things that we have failed to do, helping us to keep on that narrow path that leads to His kingdom. Now we could go to our Bibles and find many examples where God, where people or man has prayed to God and the prayers have been answered. In fact, if you like statistics, if you go to the Bible, you can find out that there are 650 occasions recorded where prayers have been made to God. And there are some 450 occasions where the prayers are recorded as having been answered. Jesus is recorded praying to his heavenly Father on 25 occasions. The Apostle Paul he, he approached the Father 41 times. You see, prayer is an important way of communication with our Heavenly Father. And it is done on many occasions. And when we look at our subject, I think we have to break the sentence down. For example, what do we mean by prayer? As we have already said, it's a one-way conversation. We have also, uh, uh, we have with our Heavenly Father... And then this, of course, leads us to another question. Who is our Heavenly Father? Who is this God to whom we should pray? Well, if we go to the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis in chapter 1, and here we can see just how powerful he is. And the opening verses of the Bible read, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And if we read the first chapter, we can see how he is the creator and sustainer of not only the universe, but everything that is on it, including man and woman. And we can also read, if we go to the last verse in this first chapter, we can read there, And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So from what we have just read, God is without doubt a very important and powerful being. And because God is so important, we should not approach him directly. And we have been given the mediator, his son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And any approach we make to God should be made through him. And just to give ourselves that reminder of how powerful God is, if we go to the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 33, we read there at verse 26, there is, like unto, no, there is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, I think that's actually Jerusalem, who rideth upon the heavens in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall destroy them. You see, when we approach God, we should do it, as I say, through his son, uh, Jesus Christ, who is our mediator and advocate. When people pray, what do they pray for? Will you come with me now to the book of James and chapter 5? And let's pick up the commentary at verse 13. James 5, verse 13. And I'm hoping as, that we, as we read these verses, we can appreciate the importance and power that we can get from prayer. Verse 13. Is, anyone among, is any among you afflicted? 
let him pray is any uh, is any yeah, is any merry let him sing psalms is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he has committed sin they shall be forgiven him confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be healed the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months and he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit yes prayer can be most powerful uh, most powerful mode in which to use and finally to try and show what I have been saying about this afternoon about why do people pray I will actually leave you with this last quotation it's the one that our chairman read to introduce this talk and this is what our saviour the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples about prayer we are coming back to Matthew's gospel and chapter 6 And let's start reading at verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, Pray to the Father in secret, and thy Father, which seest in secret, shall reward thee openly. Can I just thank you for listening?